Okay, everybody, this is Music in COVID Time 28, I think. I'm Tom Georgie, and today I'm here with Quentin Playfair, who has helped me and my, uh, the colleagues in the Top Music Baroque Orchestra keep their instruments glued together the last three decades and more. So, hi, Quentin. Hi. And we're here today to talk about the violin specifically. Um, how does the violin make sound? Okay, I'm going to tell you the basic problem that everything starts with which is strings. One string, amazingly worth about $40, just on all by itself, and uh, has to be at a very high tension, relatively speaking, just to function. Of course, you hear nothing. I'm plucking it, and nothing is happening. And yet, were it attached to a violin, lots of things would happen. So, cumulatively, the four strings on a violin push about 40 pounds, 45 pounds, onto the frame of the violin, which has to be absorbed, and the violin also has to be... <laughs> Shall we wait for the dog? No, no we should not. This okay. just adds just color, uh, uh, adds color, color, color and character. Right. Okay, well they're not fighting at least. Uh, sorry. You were at 45 pounds pressure on the violin. And Was that straight down on the bridge or that's like... No, end to end, and uh, end. Yes, not only downwards, but it all adds up to 40, 45, which is essentially the weight of a healthy five-year-old male. So that's an awful lot that a very thin item has to absorb. And why does it have to be thin? Because we want it to vibrate. At the same time, it has to be strong. And the key to all this is lies in curves. I've got a piece of paper here, and I'm going to put it under stress. Here we have something really thin, this paper. Let's put a pen, a, a coin on it. What happens? It just falls off. It just the paper just bends. It can't do it. All right. But if I were to make a curve and we'll see what the paper can do here, I can put that on and it will just slide. Curves can absorb pressure. Aha, so this is why the violin is arched. And this is why the violin is arched. And that is, violins are not flat. They have the curves on the back and on the front. I thought one if you tip the, the, the button, the end button down a little bit. Oh, okay. yes, that way? That's great, yeah. So in other words, the arching is about strength. The arching is definitely about strength. Little old-fashioned bridges you might still find in the countryside you find it on teapots from China, little round things, they absorb pressure. And that's why people are so proud of their Roman bridges where they are. Yes, exactly. Right, okay. Cool. Now you can go even further, just for fun. Uh, and for anyone who thinks that that's as far as you can go with a piece of paper, I, I would like to offer this as a sacrifice, this is my coffee, and intensely valuable to me. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to support it on end with a piece of paper like this. Seriously? And a small piece of tape. Yes, it can be done. It all depends on how you deal with the curve. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, here we go. All right. All right. Okay, one Very piece of good. paper. Granted, this has a couple of pieces of tape, but with curves, you do not have to increase the volume of the material. You just have to use your brain a bit. So in other words, the violin is a triumph of engineering. It's a brilliant piece of engineering. Aha! The violin is engineering. I'm going to have but to change the title of this. Oh, yeah, right. but it's different kind of engineering than is generally accepted. Um, we have this vision of the inventor having the eureka moment and then rushing off to the patent office. This is evolutionary engineering in which, and I suppose the modern equivalent will be the bicycle. There's nobody who actually invented the thing, it just kept on getting better and better and better as different bodies of information were exchanged with other people interested in the subject over a long period of time. And I'm a big believer in evolutionary engineering. It's generally far, far better than those uh, Eureka moments that people get excited about. Okay. Very cool. All right.
So, how thin is thin? This is just a chunk of wood I've got floating around in my workshop, but I want you to look at the edge. Is that, well, look at my two fingers on either side. Look how far apart they are. That is one either side of this piece of wood, which happens to be three millimeters thin. That is a bit thicker than the majority of violin tops. It is dramatically thicker than the violin ribs. And it is as thick as most of the edges of a violin back. But admittedly, it does get a bit thicker than that in the middle, up to 4.5 usually. Right. But that is all very lightweight indeed. And Especially because the wood itself is not a particularly dense wood, right? That was a piece oh, of... Oh, this is maple. Yeah. Oh, that was maple. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But that's one of the things that varies, right? Where different woods are, are, are have different densities. Yes, uh, they have different densities, but the pine, which is used for the top, is incredibly good at end-to-end -end pressure. You think uh, half the house building in North America is done with uh, seven eighths of the house building is done with, uh, with with softwoods, and they are amazingly good at handling longitudinal pressure. Um, uh, that's because of evolution again, right? Yep. They had to hold those uh, pine needles way above the pine needles of the neighboring tree. Well, uh, not merely that, but the bottom foot of a pine tree has to support the weight of the remaining 50 feet of pine tree. Pretty strong stuff. So it's strong stuff, which is wonderful. Uh, so both woods work. Obviously, the maple is a, a sturdier wood than the pine, but they're both pretty dramatically good material. Very cool. OK. Um, Shall we move on to? So uh, using all that material, uh, I mean, information, we can make a nicely shaped box like this. Here's Tom's violin, or one of them. And it'll work. You can pluck it. And it more, it's more it's in tune. It's wonderful. And uh, it's pretty undramatic. What you have to do to make the violin special is find some way of pumping impetus in it continuously which is, of course, the bow. And I'd like to talk about the how very frequently this sort of thing occurs. Um, let's just take, for example, a whistle. Tap a whistle, no sound. Blow on a whistle, no sound. Blow in a whistle, and suddenly they can hear you half a mile away because you are giving a continual supply of impetus to an otherwise static thing, and it really works. Uh, then, I mean, here's a glass of a wine glass, and we can do this on its own. But if we, with any luck, yeah, if there's continual impetus you get a very interesting and large sound. But it has to be continued pressure, and this, like the bow, is on-off pressure. Very, very rapid motion, uh, succession. Um, and if you want the ultimate example, it will be from the animal world, the cricket, whose body is hollow, like a violin, and which rubs itself and could be heard an irritatingly long distance away. Uh, and it works perfectly. That sound really carries. Um, also for very good evolutionary reasons. Yes. So the bow is critically important, and I think Tom is going to um, edit in a little section here with him playing that violin to show yeah. how the difference between pizzicato and, I would've done and it the real today, guys, But I forgot to bring a bow along. Anyway, I would have felt a little you know, exposed out here on the street. Oh, they're, they're a decent bunch. They can yeah. handle things. And yeah, they've all probably been fine, but I <laughs> was, I'm feeling uh, uh, self-conscious. Okay. Anyway, so shall we turn to some of these other yeah, questions? Yeah, sure. Excellent. So once you've got all this marvelous box that you've built, um, 
what are some of the ways that it can be adjusted to vary the kinds of sounds that come out? Well, uh, first stop in adjusting to try and make the sound right is check that there's nothing actually wrong with the violin. And that's routine when someone comes in wanting a change. I always look to see if anything as seams are open, the finger mode is making a bid for freedom, all that stuff. And the well, let's go through that list, actually. That's a good list. So you, you check the seams. I check the seams. Uh, by which you mean where the plates, the back and the belly, are glued to the ribs. That's right, yeah. Now those are the seams. Yeah. And if the seams are open, actually, the violin doesn't work as efficiently, right? Definitely not. No. Okay, so this is where we've got uh, top and back, and these are the ribs, and where they join, that's a seam. And they come undone quite easily, and uh, there's a good reason for that, and I'll tell you that later, um, perhaps. Okay, so we check, you okay. check the seams, you check the fingerboard. I check the fingerboard. What can go wrong with the fingerboard? It can come loose, and you just give it a little tweak here and see if you get an opening there. Right. Um, because you're the only person that's going to ever check that. No player, I've never seen a player do a quick check there to see okay. if the fingerboard's coming in place. Well, on the other it, hand, it, you know, I've been playing professionally for 40 years, and I've never seen anybody's fingerboard fall off either. Oh, it's uh, it's kind of fun because... <laughs> <laughs> well, that depends on the occasion, I suppose. Right, yes. Um, uh, actually, it's very easy to fix. Um, well, that's a, that must be a, a feature of the violin anyway, because they can be hundreds of years old, and they can't get that way unless they can be fixed, right? Exactly, yeah. This was the bit I was going to bring in later about well, the quality we'll of the tool we use. Fine. Yes. Um, so we did seams and fingerboard, yeah. and we're going to check what else. Okay, first I should say, if it does happen to, to any of you uh, watching this, uh, do quickly loosen the pressure of the strings. If the fingerboard comes, uh, yes. finger comes off. Uh, there's a lot of pressure here. We talked about all the string tightness and so on. If uh, you've got a laminate here of ebony and maple, very strong, but individually neither can take the pressure. So if the board comes off or comes loose, the, back, the maple part will bend forward and distort. So give it a break, just loosen the strings off and let things go. It doesn't matter if the post comes down, it doesn't matter sort of thing, that can all be fixed. The, if the post falls, that can be fixed. That's, that's Definitely, right. yes. Okay. Is the post an, uh, another one of the things that you check when you're checking to see uh, what, when a violin comes in, if you, yes. you're checking to see how it's working? Yeah. Um, I'm looking to see if it's fairly square to the instrument and basically in, in a certain zone behind the E string foot. Uh, I see that makers nowadays are actually putting a kind of a, a pad on the underside of the, a patch, if you yeah, will, um, on, on the underside of the belly right there. And it's about the size of, oh, I don't know, a large dime? Uh, I make it out of a quarter, or rather, <laughs> I, uh, I trace around a quarter. and then You trace it, yeah. around a quarter, and that's yeah. big, en big enough. That gives you a wide range of possible oh, yes. adjustments. Yeah. And because you can actually take the sound post and... Uh, vary the sound of the violin, right? Right, indeed you can. Um, the reason I do it here is that in North America you've got a, uh, certainly in the section most of the viewers, most of the violins are, uh, sort of northeast, uh, very hot and sticky in summer, cold and dry in winter, so the poor violin is swelling and contracting like an accordion. I mean, might actually, if you could grab your cello top and show the way that the wood moves over time. Uh, okay, yes, all right. So, because I, actually I, it only moves in two directions, it actually doesn't move in three. We actually explained already that the, the, the tree is extraordinarily strong stand, for standing up. Yeah. So in fact, it doesn't actually change length longitudinally. All right, yeah, the tree is not, if it was gray and it's running this way, you can probably see some of the stripes. This is just a roughed out cello top. There's Got, still got work to do. It's solid. I haven't put, hollowed anything out yet. So basically it's, about, it's fairly in there. But it is not going to expand or contract this way. But this way things are going to happen. And to a lesser and degree uh, tangentially as well. As right? well. Um, well, when this, this lot shrinks, it will go push up in the middle. Uh -huh. It can even lift up the top a bit carrying the bridge with it. And there's quite a few cellists I know whose instruments are, are so sensitive 
that they have a bridge for summer and a bridge for winter because in summer when it's really moist the, the whole bridge will go the whole table will go up carrying the strings with it of, uh, via the bridge making it almost impossible to play so they have a lower bridge for summer and a taller bridge for winter so just to sum up the wood movement although the wood is well seasoned and everything it continues to move uh, radially and tangentially but not longitudinally yes I got that uh, right Excellent. yes you did and you brought in a bit about time which I'd forgotten is very important a new instrument might move a little more than an old instrument but basically wood is porous and 300 year old wood is also porous and it hasn't it quite forgotten that it was on once alive yes so it absorbs moisture and it releases moisture and when it absorbs moisture it becomes bigger and it's got to go somewhere cool and up is where it goes and all uh, so although it's on the move it is very repairable as we yes. discussed before and it can last a long time how, how long can a violin last oh a violin can uh, the the oldest violins around, and there's some of them are still in use, regular use, at least 400 years. 400 years and still working for a living. Yeah. That's a bummer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely a bummer. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, but this brings up my last question for today, which is, uh, given that they can be 400 years old and still working for a living, um, uh, what sets the violin apart? How can it get away with this? Uh, and that doesn't happen for other instruments like the recorder, the flute, or especially keyboard instruments. Okay, I'm not sure about recorder or flute. I couldn't tell you because they are so simple, it really ought to work. But I know it doesn't. And my suspicion is uh, um, basic human spit, humidity, shall we be discreet and tactful here. Uh, is is making oh of course you keep the the wood uh, uh, you give it a blast of moisture all of the time yeah. yes right and maybe that's hard uh, on it and that uh, uh, creates a certain certain kind of wear that is inside and you can't see yeah yeah well but that could be actually I should have or maybe as I um, as I tidy up this video I'll actually do a proper look into that yeah uh, but I wonder uh, about the keyboard instruments. So particularly pianos, it's like uh, uh, we have to... Something have inside is going to uh, swell and shrink. Of when, when a violin, well, when wood shrinks, let's say it loses 2% of its uh, la lateral width. Well, on a violin, which is about 200 wide at, the b at its widest point, okay, that's going to 2%, it's going to be 4 millimeters. Uh, on a bass, it's going to be a whole lot more. Uh, you're going to, it's going to be pulling, trying to a ho open up a hole in itself of about, let's say, eight millimeters. And that's a lot. Oh, yes. And a piano will be a whole bundle of very large uh, issues like that, just because of its size. So basically, in a way, the, the instruments are wearing themselves out. Yes. Again, they're wearing themselves out against themselves. Uh, well, so I guess we'll uh, okay, wrap I, this up. I, I haven't quite finished with... Oh, we've got things. some more. Excellent. Well, more things to look at when, when you're checking your instrument. Oh, um, goodness. Let's go back to that. Well, yeah, if you don't mind. We, 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 uh, we did the seams and the, the um, uh, fingerboard and the sound, uh, yeah. sound oh. post, but we didn't right. say anything about the bridge. We haven't said anything about the bridge, which can be leaning forward generally or backwards, or just even, or, or be rather curved. Uh, uh, warped. Right, warped, well, yes. what we want the bridge to be is perpendicular to the table for the back of the bridge. And yeah. that is the tailpiece side of the bridge. Yes. Did I get that right? Yes. Excellent. And if the string is uh, frayed a bit as it goes over the bridge, it tends to grab the bridge and pull it forward when you tune it. And it also happens that if you're accustomed to tuning with fine tuners and you switch to gut strings, which you need to tune with pegs because there's such a larger latitude of uh, adjustment that's needed, uh, you're going to pull your bridge towards the fingerboard. Yeah. The other thing to know about fingerboards, uh, bridges, excuse me, uh, is that the bridges are 
flat on one side and curved on the other. Yes. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you don't want the side of the bridge near the tailpiece, you don't want that looking curved. No, it's definitely. Flat. <laughs> Absolutely right. It's flat. Yeah. Anything to know about the tailpiece? Uh, yes, tailpieces can crack. Tailpieces can get nicely wedged under um, chin rests and create an interesting buzz, which is good because then you can be a hero and solve the whole problem in 30 seconds. Oh, it's always nice when there's a, 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 an easy solution, yes. Yeah. Um, what else should you do? End oh, pins. what about pegs? Well, pegs, I was going to get to that. Uh, pegs just drive me crazy. Yeah, pegs ought to work without much trouble. There's a funny thing about people under 14. They cannot tune pegs, and that's a very unusual person, because they can't combine the mi mixture of twisting and pushing at the same time for some reason. So uh, let's just go step back for a second, uh, kind of on general principles. Uh, pegs work because certain kinds of tapers uh, stick, isn't that right? Uh, yeah, you, you've got a, a bit of a degree of latitude in the kind of taper. What you absolutely have to have is the same kind of taper on the pegs in the hole, so everything is touching. I had a student this morning describing his the torture of tuning an instrument. He's borrowed the instrument, which is why uh, I couldn't tell him to do what needed to be done. Um, so he, he just touches the pegs and they go zip and they come loose. Yes. Uh, and so I was explaining to him, I just want to check with you that I got it right. Basically, the pegs have worn into a somewhat oval shape. Uh, yes, that can happen when it shrinks. And therefore, they're only touching in a couple of places. Yes. And then when they get to a wider part of the hole, off they go. Yes. And furthermore, you can compound the thing by having the hole go slightly oval so that it's like two ellipses and they've just got one magic spot where they stick like glue. Generally it's just a little bit flat or just a tiny bit sharp um, and you cannot get it out from there. That's very frustrating. Yeah. Um, but the solution is actually to take it to your violin shop and get them t tuned up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is an easy fix. Uh, uh, you use actually a, a reamer for the hole, is that right? That's right, yeah. And a kind of a big pencil sharpener for the uh, peg. Yes. And yeah. the two have to match each other very closely. And when they do, actually, the pegs work very well. Yeah. Uh, it's really a pleasure to use. I don't think we've said much about the cello yet. Oh, the reason I, I dragged the cello out is just to say that with all the right curves here, this thing is still acoustically useless because it's uncut unhollowed on the inside and that too is going to be really rather thin. Uh, uh, so right now it's no more than a piece of wood from the lumber yard. Well it's a, uh, a, a it's really high quality piece of wood. It's a high quality piece of wood. Uh, and this one <laughs> was, this is spruce. Yeah. Yeah, the I, uh, this, yeah. this time I guessed right. And I'm still give us yes. a little tunk on that thing that well, uh, the sound of it? Well there's, there's nothing much to, I can get a pretend musical note I suppose there. Uh, but it's optimistic, really. I could probably get the same out of a piece of 2 by 4 at the local hardware store. Right. Once it's hollowed out, that's going to be a different question, and it will become, with any luck, a music, uh, recognizable musical thing. Well, I think, you know what? Uh, uh, we did really good work today here, Quentin. Thank, Thank you me. so much for your help. Hey, my pleasure. And I think we better um, uh, wind it down. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks Great. a lot. Thanks, Tom.